we're bringing alive the evocative food of the Middle East. Um, and I hope you also had a chance to see the Safari Voices exhibition. So this event is designed to complement that. I'm delighted to welcome a stellar lineup of Michael Levenfall, Sammy Subeda, Claudia Roden, Michael Dan Daniel, and Linda Dangor. And I'm sure you can't wait to hear from all. But before that, we're going to hear from a very special person, Bea Lefkowitz, who's the executive director of Safari Voices UK and has been absolutely key in bringing together the exhibition and the series of events. So, thank you, Bea. We don't have so much time this evening, so I'd just like to welcome you on behalf of Safari Voices UK and also welcome so many interviewees here. And if you want to, uh, to see an interview with Sami Subeda and Linda Dangur, uh, you can go to the Rich Library and see it. And just to say, please find more information. If anyone wants to be interviewed for Safari Voices, please get in touch with me. And I think this is our first event for the exhibition. And I think it's very appropriate that it is about food because food is really central in many interviews, and it's a central part of identity and it's linked to memory. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Good evening. Can firstly, can everyone hear me? Um, my name is Michael Leventhal. Um, I was the founder of a food charity and festival called The Filter Fest. Um, I remember one lady complained that it sounded too Ashkenazi and said that she would never come. But in fact, the majority of the contributors were Safari cooks and writers. Um, I am the least knowledgeable person on the panel, so I'm going to do as little talking as possible. Um, we've got just a, about an hour or so to talk about various aspects of food and memory. Um, and you should have picked up as you came in uh, these little booklets that have recipes from everyone on the panel. So you can get one there just at the front desk. So I'm going to start by just asking everyone on the panel to introduce themselves and explain the, the recipe that they've chosen and explain the memory that's associated with it. So, Claudia, you can start with your chicken sweet, please. Well, um, I chose it because uh, when we came, well, when my parents came to London after the Suez Crisis in 1956, uh, they finally got a home in um, in Golders Green, and um, my mother started cooking, and cooking became what really gave her pleasure because she wanted to cook what my father loved. Um, because in Egypt she had a cook, so she didn't cook very much, but she had to teach the, the cook because the, the cook came from a village in Upper Egypt and had to learn all the family dishes. But so when she came here, she was cooking a lot and I learned a lot from her, but this dish is the dish that she made every Friday night. And all the family got together, the children and grandchildren. And uh, so for me, it's very, very important. I have to, have to say, my, my wife's mother is from Egypt. And if, if I don't eat her chicken sofrito, and if I don't enjoy it, I haven't just rejected the recipe, I've rejected her entire family history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Linda, can you tell us about your mother Yeah, so my, um, my, the recipe that I've uh, chosen is a milk based recipe, which I've changed uh, into uh, almond milk, uh, because I find it a bit um, lighter. It's a recipe that evokes all my childhood. It's got hardener in it, rose water, um, <coughs> and almonds. And the combination of those three, for me, is magical. It just uh, evokes my garden in Baghdad. But also, the rose water is the kind of perfume that my two grandparents, uh, my two grandmothers, used to put as a perfume on, on themselves. So whenever you went to kiss them, <laughs> <laughs> there is the smell of rose water, and every time I smell rose water, I think of that. So that is why I chose my recipe. Michael, good evening. Uh, Michael Daniel. My dish is beetroot cut to kuba, which is a very traditional Iraqi dish. I only know it's a Shabbat dish because we only ever ate it on Shabbat. Uh, I think I grew up hating vegetables, so having that same dish every Friday was quite a challenge. So I think at first it was just the soup. Have the soup, but you know, don't have the vegetables. 
But then I mean, as the, the weeks would go on or the years went on, I would start facing these subtle differences every week. Oh, mint or, or coriander. And it was those subtle differences every week that started sort of making a click in my brain. And then every week we would, we would taste the beetroot cut to cover and we would compare. It's either sweeter this week, it's a bit more sour. And this is how it went throughout the childhood. The recipe here is from the Gate Cookbook, so it's a vegetarian recipe. Traditionally growing up, it wasn't vegetarian, it probably had chicken in it, the covers. And that's my dish, beetroot cut to cover. Sam? Yes, well, uh, in Baghdad, um, in the Jewish uh, neighborhoods, not only our house, but so many other houses around the street, you would have this wonderful, pungent smell coming on a Thursday, on a Thursday evening, usually, uh, of garlic and cumin <coughs> frying in butter. And that's a very evocative smell. I love that made me hungry and still does. And that was because the Thursday evening uh, so dairy uh, supper uh, in most uh, Iraqi Jewish folk was kitchri, uh, which is a combination of rice and lentils uh, cooked with uh, uh, in a little bit of tomato paste uh, and flavored uh, with this fried garlic and cumin, which is then poured over the uh, fries and lentils. And the, uh, then it would be served out and sometimes be garnished with fried cheese, halloumi type cheese, fried, uh, and onions. And in some households of ours, they have a fried egg on top as well. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so this was also interesting because uh, we had the sauce that went with it was yogurt, yet plain yogurt. And this was particularly uh, significant because, you know, the uh, sort of Middle Eastern, uh, certainly Iraqi food culture, yogurt was eaten with everything, you know. But the Jews would not have yogurt with, with their meals. It had to be eaten breakfast or something, because you couldn't mix uh, dairy and, and uh, meat. And so the one sort of veg veg vegetarian or rather vegetable supper, which did not include meat, allowed us to have yogurt uh, and fried cheese uh, as part of a kind of main course, main course supper, which was a particular delight, because I think we all love yogurt. <laughs> So that's, uh, and then of course I subsequently learned about that this dish has a history, an ancestry. That, you know, kitchri or puchari uh, is an Indian dish, also rice and lentils, uh, and that it was noted by Ibn Battuta, the Arab traveler in the 13th century, uh, uh, when he went to India. Uh, and then it seemed to have been transformed in, and migrated to various places. It came to Iraq, probably through seafarers to get from the Gulf to Basra, or maybe through the Jewish connections of the Jewish communities in, from Baghdad. Uh, and uh, it also went to Egypt, where it's called uh, uh, koshari and become a street food. And people there think of its pharaonic origin. They don't know the uh, And of course, it came to uh, England through, or Britain through Anglo, Anglo Indian connections in the form of kedgeri, which became the, the lentil disappeared and you have the uh, uh, smoked fish instead. So, anyway, so the dish has a interesting saga behind it in the history. <coughs> Can I ask you, we all talk about these memories are clearly still very strong and vivid, um, but why? That keeping with his talk is why is food so important and why are these memories perhaps more important than the memories you may have of music or of literature or of other things from your childhood? What's so important about the food memories? Mm -hmm. uh, music and uh, the visual arts don't need words. They're things that are felt or when you see something, you have a kind of um, a physical reaction. 
as, as the case. Uh, language uh, needs words as a vehicle to um, describe things, to express things. And so I think language is like a, a body, a bit like our body, that needs to be exercised. That means it needs to be written and spoken daily for it to develop and evolve. Now, for the displaced person, or some the, the, the people who migrate from one place to another, they, they have to get used to the language of the land. So therefore, their language, and therefore literature, and the development of literature, um, fades away over time. But the thing that they have daily, repeatedly, is food. And for me, that is the most humble, but the, the quickest way to relate to some kind of root that you have with, with your family or with your country that you left behind. Whereas music can uh, evoke, and literature obviously can evoke um, roots and memories. But I think what is done daily is something that you keep in contact with much more than any kind of artistic um, expression, which, which is not for everybody, if you like. So that's why I think it's, uh, the, it's symbolic. The food becomes symbolic at the forefront um, of, of this kind of thing because of so many also, so, so much migration is at the moment and globalization. So everything gets mixed up. And I think food has become a, a vehicle of culture because of that. It's a very hard question in so many ways. Um, um, I'm obviously not Iraqi, I mean, I'm born here, so I have a different kind of heritage that I connect to through my, my parents and my grandparents. And I think for me, it was all about connecting to the past that I never knew, about these stories that I heard about. And often it was spoken about Shabbat, and, you know, big meals or, or festivals, or before Passover, they would cook for weeks on the roof until, you know, until Passover was ready, because they were always preparing. So for me, it was always about drawing, drawing the path back to, to, to my present. So I think I have a different um, journey to you. Um, now on to the question. <laughs> Would you agree for me? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I think, well, I suppose we all know that when people move and immigrants and migrants, uh, it is usually the one thing that they keep longest, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, they forget their language over the generations, they forget their music, they don't wear their clothes anymore, but the food is something that is kept up. And I think even if you haven't been born in a place, because people uh, have this way of uh, uh, cooking what their parents cooked to remember their parents. And this is uh, something that is kept up, and I think Jews more than other people, because they have all those festivals at holidays, they have Shabbat food. They might eat everything in the world now, which they do, um, during um, most of the year and most of the week. But uh, a lot of people feel when there is a holiday, they want to cook a dish that reminds them of their family, that reminds them who they are. And um, in that case, it's important. When you first came to England, the, the ingredients weren't all available, though. Yeah. So presumably now it's much easier to maintain those traditions. Yes, uh, very, very much easier. But when I came to England, you could hardly find any. And uh, uh, really, when I, um, uh, when I started collecting recipes, it was when people started left Egypt, all of a sudden, in a state of shock. And uh, because uh, we were a community that wasn't just Egyptian, we were a mixed community. Uh, we were uh, people from all over the Ottoman world. 
who had come to Egypt. And so we weren't all eating Egyptian food. In my family, we had Syrian food and also Judeo Spanish food. Because one grandmother had come from Istanbul. She still had Judeo Spanish dishes. But nobody ever had a cookbook, they just didn't exist. So when they came, there was this horrible feeling. Uh, we'll never be able to eat something that I've eaten at your house. And uh, all the aunts, there was an aunt who came from North Africa or some, mostly they came from Syria. But the fact that we lose dishes, this terrible feeling that we're going to lose our heritage was very, very strong. And people were exchanging recipes who before would never talk about food. I mean, they were always eating or entertaining and all that, but suddenly, they suddenly would never give each other recipes. But suddenly, that was a thing that we felt we must, uh, we must keep. So that's, for me, the idea that the recipes were precious, and we have to remember, because it's our heritage. What sort of colleagues said for them? There's something particular about food that you're taking it into yourself. Yes, yes, because uh, uh, yes, everything else, music and, uh, and art and all that, you don't put it inside you. So food is part of you. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm copying Carlo Petrini of Slow Food. Because wherever he goes, he said, we all spend so much money on underwear knickers that you put on, they're outside, and we don't put money in what we eat. What we eat goes inside us. <laughs> we should care a lot more. But for, us, for us, the fact that we eat it tells us who we are. It is really like your identity, your roots, and your connection with your family, your grandparents, you can remember them by. It's something you need it. It doesn't go through the intellect, yes. like music. You just feel. You can yeah. think about it afterwards. Uh, food is the same, taste is the same. It doesn't go through the intellect. So it's, it's yeah. inside you. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that, that is the immediacy of it. Yeah, but I think taste and smell is one of the things that really triggers memory. Music does as well. Yeah. But those memories of smell and taste are very personal, usually because they remind you of somebody who cooked for you or a place. Uh, it's like an imprint. Yeah. 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 It's like a hard wiring almost, I find. <coughs> You've been hard wired through food, through childhood and adolescence. Um, are we genetically programmed like the food of our granddad? Well, of course, we are genetically yeah. programmed to eat now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, no, I mean, I agree, obviously, food, uh, unlike any other uh, of the uh, sort of arts or whatever, is sort of visceral. You know, I think what you've already been saying, it's really a question of, uh, especially for, you know, the people who grew up in uh, the old country. Like, that. like I was talking about the smell of, uh, of, of, of uh, cumin and, and garlic on Thursday evenings and so on. All these things uh, sort of trigger memories and have sort of in almost visceral effect. But then for subsequent generations who did not grow up there, you know, obviously there are particular kitchens and particular families, as Claudia and all the colleagues have said. Uh, but it doesn't have that same kind of association, well, for, for some it does, but not so uh, generally. But I think uh, what we're ignoring is that, you know, you talk, you asked Claudia when we, when we first came, you know, there was nothing. They, you, you had to look at very specialist shops in London to get the ingredients. But now, of course, they're everywhere. Not only are they everywhere, but food has become a spectacle. I mean, you know, it's in all all the television programs, all all the magazines, all the cookbooks, uh, all the star chefs, and so on. You know, I was very struck. You know, when as children, I remember in hot summers. You know, not just children, everybody. You know, for, for the hot summers in in uh, for evening meals, sometimes 
you just had watermelon and white cheese, which I still think is a lovely combination, very refreshing, and so on. And then they, you forgot it. And then suddenly I, I was in New York uh, last year, and I was talking to friends in, uh, and said, well, this is now a common dish among all the New York intelligentsia. Why? Because Otto Lenghi has written it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, rather than losing our identity through food, you know, now the identity is becoming, you know, the field of identity is wide open, or rather the field of food is wide open, and people can construct all kinds of identities from this open field. <laughs> and, you know, it, you, you know, things that were rare and, uh, you know, only known in certain parts, you know, like palm grenade molasses, which, you know, in the 1980s, you couldn't get it in Istanbul, for instance, you know. Now it's everywhere. Uh, and, you know, it's, everybody thinks of it, well, this is Middle Eastern food, or this is uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, you know, is the other one. Uh, and, you know, things like Frika, which is very particular, you know, I don't know, do you know what Frika is? No, no. Yeah, again, it's Otto Lenghi who really made Frika. <laughs> So then, uh, you know, I, I don't think there is any problem about food and identity anymore, because all the diasporas, you know, they are inventing their food and identity from all the ingredients that are available to them, and all the information that's available. <coughs> but do you think, on one hand, the, the globalization, or you call it McDonaldization, is a bad thing, because you can buy, you can buy a tub of hummus at the BP garage on the corner, and in restaurants throughout London now, you can see Mahalabaya, and it's just noted as an aromatic milk pudding, so do things lose their identity because they become so common? Um, no, I, I don't think uh, they lose their identity. I think, uh, uh, first of all, I should say it's a good thing. Uh, obviously, the fact that all these things are available, you can make what they want out of them, both you know, in terms of eating and also in terms of thinking. Uh, but they, they don't lose their identity. I think they complicate identity. You know. um, I mean, you know, the fact that we did, in Baghdad, in, uh, we, we didn't, in my boyhood, hummus was something new, hummus potena, was something new in Baghdad. The Syrian uh, people brought it in, the Palestinian people brought it in. Uh, now, it is, is it not only common there, but common everywhere. 40% of the of British households have hummus in their fridge. And uh, you, know, you have things like Moroccan hummus in supermarkets. That's, that's a news to Moroccan. <laughs> but I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, it's, it's very good. You know, availability, variety. You can make what you want of it, both physically and symbolically. Claudia, do things lose their identity, or is this a good thing? Yes, it is a good thing. Uh, in a way, <laughs> so we think, uh, do we want to lose culture? Do we want to lose it? Uh, no, we don't want to lose uh, culture for all kinds of reasons, but certainly our global culture that we have, the autolengues and all the new fashions, it's actually fashions, and they change all the time. I mean, well, they have to, because you have to write a, a column yeah. every week. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. And they are now global. Uh, they are global, and, uh, and uh, people have to create. It's become something, food has become something other. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but at the same time, what I'm seeing in many countries, people decide they want that cuisine. And it's a kind of gastro-nationalism. It hasn't happened here, because nobody here likes that cuisine. <laughs> they like everything that you could, anything new, uh, whether it comes from Korea. Korean is the latest, you know? And uh, we've gone through, let's hope that they'll stick to, to Eastern Mediterranean, Israeli for a long time because it's good as well. But the thing is, every type of cuisine comes and people have to, because for many reasons, one of the reasons is the editors of the newspapers just 
ask people to do something original. Everything has been done. Everything. They've gone through every French dish, every Italian dish. If you look up in the internet, now I'm looking up before, nobody knew anything. But now, whatever you know, everybody else knows already, or they can find it immediately on the internet. And, uh, and yes, it is happening also in Italy, where mama doesn't cook anymore. Mama doesn't cook, and every, uh, and uh, cert certainly she, do she does cook. <laughs> but she cooks very easy things, and she buys most of the pasta, soft pasta that you can buy already made. She makes the sauce and everything. But there is, um, uh, people learn in Italy from the internet, just as they do here. But, uh, but what is happening is that on the internet, if you look up some of the Italian sites, uh, what they have is, uh, this is the original, the authentic dish from a region, and it comes from my grandmother. And if you like, you can see my grandmother in a video cooking it. <laughs> and it's the same as happening in many countries where they were afraid that they were losing their culture. There is such a thing as countries that appreciate their culture. It's happening in Catalonia. It's happening in several regions in Spain. And of course it's not happening in America, it's not happening in Australia, and it's not happening here. I think it's happening in very strongly in America and Australia, but not for American and Australian food. It's all the communities and the diasporas there who are who are actually reconstructing and often inventing their national foods on that stage, because you know all the restaurants and the markets and the uh, and the magazines and what have you. So an actual fact, I think. Well, I mean, uh, there is a good case to be made that Italian food as national cuisine was actually invented in America. Uh, and uh, so many others, you know, because everybody is trying to uh, produce their food, uh, produ you know, presenting their food on a kind of global stage with which America is the biggest. The restaurant business, the restaurant was a fantastic vehicle uh, to, to allow people to understand an exotic quote unquote, uh, cuisine. And I often wondered, uh, now actually you'll see loads of them in the um, Edgeware Road, I often wondered why people didn't have uh, a knowledge about Iraqi cooking. And that is because there weren't any restaurants. So every time you have a restaurant, like the Lebanese, they're very good and they uh, distributed their, their food all over and people got to know about Lebanese food in the same way as the Italians. Um, so I think um, it was a, a fantastic way of, of promoting a country's food. Um, but now that what we're seeing, that everything is global, and the, the, the food becomes a, a mixture, a, a sort of a, but I remember but it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. So, sorry, I'm just trying to get my 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 uh, my mind uh, around it. It's a little bit like when Europe said no more borders, and we, so everybody can mix with everybody. What happens afterwards? You get a backlash. And everybody wants to put up their borders, and I think in food, a lot of people said we want the food that Granny used to make. We don't want any of this sophisticated food where there's uh, pomegranates everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's a response to it's a, Yes, yes. And so you yeah. want to sort of withdraw a little bit and say, that's, that's mine. Yeah. yeah, I think it's going in both directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. As globalization is taking it everywhere, there are, you know, children who want their grandmother's food, <coughs> have an authentic memory of the food they had, and that it's been disseminated, is that the right word? It's, yeah, it's, and um, well, can I ask through, through the Gate restaurant, how much do you think you were celebrating the food of your parents and grandparents, and how much did you change things and have you over the years so you have a vegetarian menu? 
Only in the early days was will we try to recreate that world because it was very personal at first. I think as time went on, we felt it wasn't really right for the audience. Um, we needed more sort of Europe. We, we went through a lot of European food at one point. Our evolution of learning to cook because French Italian food had the, all the essence of cooking and sauces and how to cook. Um, so the food changed. Um, what's the original question? I got confused. How, about, uh, how far did you even moved away from the original recipes? Partly the changes in. I think in my cell I haven't moved away at all. But in the restaurant, it, it's it's like a river going in a direction. You've got to flow with that river. Can you flow without meat? Mm -hmm. You haven't moved. Well, can you have flow without meat? I guess that you think we've got to think about the essence of the dish, which is the cover and. The, because we've taken the meat and the fish out of the or anything that was an animal based product out of the dishes. But we don't. Have the food food food. Food. Yeah, but I think Arabic food is more, you know, when you grow up with big plates of food, big bowls of rice, and big bowls of vegetables, and salads, and so on and so forth. You can't do that unless you've got to put a plate, a dish on a plate for six pounds as a starter. You know. Yes, he did. He did. It's true. Very simple. And then you just take a little bit of meat. I think that that's how we that's how we that's how we evolved. You know, putting food on the plate, one thing at a time. And we moved a little bit away from Arabic Indian food because I didn't think it was mainstream vegetarian food. And you're trying to say maybe a bit like it's a long story. I can't really go into it. Maybe it doesn't make sense what I'm. Well, it's a bit, I think in your cookbook you've also changed recipes, probably maybe the French influence and trying to make things lighter and healthier. No, it's true, uh, trying to make things lighter and healthier, but it has no French uh, influence whatsoever. Uh, I mean, when I was in France, uh, when I first went to France, it was the late 70s, um, I went out to, to eat in restaurants almost every day. And after about a week, I started to have problems here. <laughs> I didn't realize I had pain. Um, because the food was incredibly heavy, because of the cream and the butter. And then the nouvelle cuisine came, and that was a little bit more sort of, uh, it was lighter, and it had more of a Japanese touch, and it was not so abundant on a plate. In fact, you had to sort of use a microscope to see what, what was on the plate. And, and it sort of, um, yes, it got like a slide, got used to it. But in France, I appreciated everything, everything. The cheese, is, uh, the food was delicious. Funnily enough, when I came back here, which was in sort of mid 90s, so I was away a long time, I started to find that English cooking or, or the British sort of food was far more sophisticated and lighter and, and better <coughs> than France. And so I come back to, to, to what you asked about my book. I, I prefer not to fry, although <coughs> certain foods are, are delicious fried, but I prefer not to, that's how uh, I would prefer to, to eat. So I've, I've changed a few things, but I have also kept the authenticity. I haven't tried to change too much in my book, except at the end, I've done a few personal sort of creative recipes that, that uh, are mine. But uh, I've tried to be very, very true to the recipes of, of your own, or of my family. Uh, That's what, sorry, I'm talking about personal things, but I mean, my, my point, um, will not become vegetarian because she thinks it would be too much a rejection of her mother and grandmother's food. Would, if Cesar, your grandson, said he wants to be a vegetarian, would you regard that as, as peculiar or would you be? Is that a rejection of your culture? Uh, no, no he, he rejected my culture all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he would only eat four things for, yeah, for many years. Uh, yes. Uh, Cesar is my older grandson, <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, but all of a sudden, I mean, we couldn't, whatever we, I made, he wouldn't eat. He would just say, have you got any pasta? He wanted cheddar on it and an egg, and that's all, a sweet corn. And then suddenly, he wanted to eat everything, and I think he was like 15 or 16. 
and now he's a food entrepreneur. <laughs> and he uses, uh, but through my daughter, because my daughter, Nadia, his aunt, uh, writes recipes <coughs> of ice lollies, and he makes ice lollies. But some of his ice lollies are things, for instance, the Mohalameya. He's, she, my daughter, has turned it into an ice lolly, which he makes, which he now exports to Korea. <laughs> <laughs> he, she, uh, she's done a new book where she, a lot of the recipes are, it's a memory of her grandfather, my father, Cesar, when he ate watermelon with feta cheese, with, sorry, with, uh, uh, with arak, you know. So the memories have come out because in creative, what you know, what you love, does come back in some way. Can I ask Sally, because Michael Lee Bray said something about this. You mentioned the change from a visceral memory to a cultural memory. What's the, the journey that the different generations go through in projecting or trying to embrace their food culture? Well, I think what I said to you is the, the, this kind of conventional sociological wisdom about migration, you know, that uh, uh, generations, the first, the people who migrate, you know, first of all are trying to establish themselves in the country of their, this is mostly comes from America, um, and uh, their, their first generation children are uh, trying to be American, so they, they don't either reject or put aside the, uh, their parents' uh, culture. It's the third generation who are established themselves as Americans who then want to rediscover their uh, culture of their grandparents and also lends them uh, a specific identity and a kind of exoticism, you know, in relation to the kind of bland, gentle American culture. As I say, I'm not sure. I mean, there is some, of course, there are so many different cases. I mean, there's some truth in that in a general way. Uh, talking about the exotic, uh, when we arrived in, in England, I was 12 years old, and my uh, brothers were 11 and 6, I think, yeah, 6. And what we found exotic were things out of a tin. <laughs> so, uh, peaches in syrup with cream, fantastic. Um, cakes that were made, you know, instantly, just with a bit of water. So we ate very, very badly for a very long time. I mean, my mother was tearing her hair up because she wanted us to eat properly. But we, just like your grandson, and we just like very, very uh, processed food. We never had it. It was so delicious. <laughs> and for us, that was exotic. Yes. Well, my gra my daughter who is here at the house. When uh, on, on one occasion her two, uh, her brother and her sister went away to camp, and she was the youngest, and I told her, now you're alone, can you tell me what you want to eat? And he kept eating all, because I was trying recipes, everything, everything you can think of, and I said, I can, what do you want? And she said, can I have fish fingers? <laughs> and she wanted spaghetti in the rings from a tea. <laughs> <laughs> so I just went and bought these. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it was probably just your family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably the whole nation. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, we came from the, the land of plenty. We came from oh, Iraq yeah. and then Lebanon, where, where we used to actually take the fruit off the tree and it was ripe and it really tasted wonderful. Uh, and, and so when we came here, no, it was new. We, were, we didn't appreciate what we had. And then, of course, as you get older, you think, oh, my goodness. You know, I wish I could get that fruit as it was, you know, then. Um, uh, I wish I could buy it because, I mean, yeah. fruit doesn't taste like that. Unless you go to southern Italy or, or, or Spain, you get a really good juice of tomato. But when you, when you cut a tomato, it just sort of bleeds on the plate. I mean, it's delicious. But, uh, anyway. Michael, what do your children find exotic? What, what do they want to eat? Or what are you forcing them to eat? My little one is a real food. He wants to eat everything. Loves things like cheese and moussacks and dandelion. What cheese and moussacks? 
or you know things like that. Indian sweets. He, he's he's up for almost anything. The older one is into his pasta, but he does like his beetroot cutlet on a Friday night with rice, and slowly <coughs> it's growing. Because I try and force this whole Arabic, Indian, Jewish thing on my children. <laughs> For my own pleasure, because... <laughs> What's interesting with your family is that they, they moved from Iraq to India maybe three generations uh, ago, three or four generations. Yeah. And so they kept this memory of the homeland very, very strongly, even though their food must have started to be more, much more Indian. And then you were born here, and you still have echoes on their echo of the homeland. It's, it's quite interesting. Well, my grandmother was a great cook, and that was, yeah, it was a mix of Indo-Iraqi food. Um, but I think it was the stories of the uncles and the things that went on that made you curious to want these things. Um, a lot of it was storytelling through my father. Claudia, in your book, I think I did break out on regimes for her yeah. and you talk about trying to keep Egyptian Jewish culture alive through through the recipes that you collected. We're now we've just had the 16th anniversary of the Suez Crisis. So, do you think have you succeeded? Has Egyptian Jewish culture survived through the recipes? Um, well, I think because a lot of people tell me that their grandchildren are using my book. So I think uh, certainly a lot of people who, um, who have written cookbooks, Jewish cookbooks, uh, Sephardi ones in particular, are people who came out relatively recently, it means from 60 years ago. And it's only decades that uh, recipe books have come out from Morocco, from, uh, from um, Turkey, the Turkey Jewish cookbooks. Uh, when I started researching, I couldn't find it. Suddenly, there are no. And I think a lot of people do refer to them. And, and I do get people who aren't from Egypt, because you were asking about recipes that go up, or, or from anywhere, in America in particular. Uh, restaurants who want to do an Egyptian Passover, then they want to do a Moroccan Passover, <coughs> and they ask, what shall we make as a Moroccan Passover? What shall we make? So there is this idea that we want to celebrate uh, the dishes of a certain country, and they think it's a, it's a gimmick, maybe, a good idea, but there are there is one woman, for instance, who had a pop-up restaurant for several weeks that was all Iraqi food. In New York. Was in New York. Yes. And she she and she was Eskenazi actually. She is Eskenazi. Yeah. Yeah. She was doing she was doing <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> and she did visit me in London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so really a lot of things are happening that if you didn't write it down it might not have, it's important, it was important to write them down. And, um, but there are things now where you never thought you'd find a dish, and they want to do the dish. But there are things like in Spain, there's the Camino Sefarad. Now, a lot of restaurants are opening, uh, it's a tourist thing, uh, where they're going to do the Jewish recipe, they're looking for Jewish recipes to have in the restaurant, so that bringing back the past. And, uh, and okay, inventing it. <laughs> yes, they might be inventing it, but if it's written down, they can invent it if they want to. But they have, uh, but I think for me, one of the interesting things about the FINA is that uh, I was in, in Egypt, I was giving a seminar to the Chefs Association, and at the end I had lots of people coming uh, uh, to ask me things, and there were lots of young journalists, but somebody came who was the, the manager of Egyptian Air, and he came and he said, I have to tell you that we have uh, our lines going to Singapore, with the Singapore Airlines, we have a joint uh, uh, thing on the line. Uh, and uh, Singapore 
decided to do something to please us. They wanted to do a dish that was Egyptian, and um, so that we're happy to go and eat it. And they, they, it was Dafina. And he said, I asked everybody I knew, do you know Dafina? Nobody knew Dafina. <laughs> and then he said, when, the, when you, I heard you were coming, I got your book and I looked up and I found Dafina. And Singapore uh, Airlines had it there. And I said, are you going to ask them to take it off now? Because it's this Jewish Sabbath dish. And he said, no, if they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> Writing a book and does that make the, uh, the cuisine or, or the dishes live on? I think, I think so. I think so. Uh, I mean, in, in my case, I'm surprised every time when somebody comes and says to me, oh, my grandchild is doing, uh, uh, is having a party and is using your, your, your book for the recipes. Uh, or, or people who are not born in Baghdad who are actually doing the, the recipes, making the recipes. And I think, yes, it is, it's, it's something you give out there, and it's there, it's written down, and a bit like the internet, you can always research it and, 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 get, uh, and get the information, but at least it's there. And I think the reason also to, during writing my book, what happened to me was, I, I don't know if it's the same with you, uh, Claudia, is that I felt as well that it was marking, making a point that the Jews have been in the Middle East for a very long time, and in Iraq especially for thousands of years. And I didn't want to be air airbrushed out. So by writing a book about, about our food, yeah. I felt that I was sort of putting my little flag there and saying, and we were there as well for a long time. And I think, you know, all those people now who are uh, writing in Eastern dishes in all or Matthew, a lot of them, including your town and including your come and tell me, uh, that's where I've got my information. And I, it's my bedside reading. And I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. And I think, well, it's, uh, they can do what they like. And they do it their way, they change it. And that's wonderful. Uh, but, you know, we, we are doing something that uh, at least it's written down. After that, you can change it as well, as much as you like. <laughs> we, we, I think we have time for just one more question, and then we'll see what questions you have here. Um, I think if you ask most people, not just people outside, to name some Jewish foods, they'll mention chicken soup, they'll mention bagels, they'll mention Ashkenazi dishes. So, but Sephardi food is becoming more popular. What will Sephardi food, which dishes will become the iconic ones? Uh, there's so many countries. I mean, each one has a different uh, emblematic Jewish food, you know, iconic Jewish food, so you can't. Uh, you might have the Fina, we will have the wheat, you know, so it's very difficult. Do you not think what happens in Israel is a good representation of what might happen in terms of that question? Because this was a melting pot of all these Jewish cultures, let's say all the Jewish Arab cultures, and certain things in Israel have made a splash, have made a noise, certain dishes. I can't think what they are right now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you see them in Israel, like, it's very, like, Chakshuka is Moroccan, right? It's everywhere in Israel, and it has been for a very long time. That captured the imagination, I don't know why, more than other dishes from other parts. The it kuma is quite... On, on the cake industry as well. I mean, because if you go to the supermarkets in Israel, there's somebody here from Israel who is a, who is a food anthropologist. She might have something to tell us after. But uh, yes, it is, you know, there's a food entrepreneur who decides to make those dishes in a certain kumba or a certain, because there's so many different people, so many in, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, and the, one person decides to produce them and they sell them in the supermarket. Or else there's a shop or a restaurant or just a street food person who actually decides to do something 
And that becomes a threat to There isn't like one or two iconic. Uh, no, there are many. For each country, yeah. there is one. I, I thought this uh, so called Sahir yeah. called on a big way <laughs> with the very something. Well, you know Pride, pride, pride over the with the uh, hard work there. We never call it Sabir. Uh, uh, no, of course. Well, in the story of why it's called Sabir. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, you can really have a whole lot of dishes that everybody knows. Not everybody, but you know as being Ashkenazi. Because they have a standard kind of, uh, of cuisine. Uh, but the Sephardi world is regional, and you get dishes in different cities, even not just every country. If you research Morocco <coughs> or Tunisia, and you ask for a couscous, a meat couscous, a Sabbath couscous, each town has a different one. And so this is, there's so much variation. So I think what will become iconic eventually, I don't know if there will be a Sephardi one, but Certainly, Judeo-Spanish dishes, they've, even, they've lasted 500 years. People have gone on cooking them, maybe changing them in Turkey. But, but now, the people there might not want to do them anymore because it takes too much time. But they are going to be there in, in some kind of, they've got all their books. You know, just one point I was thinking, about the evolution of food and how you were saying, well, everybody's, uh, there isn't a regional food anymore. Everybody like Otto Lange and people like that are taking from different parts of the world and making their own food and their own identity. <coughs> I was just thinking about the Ottoman Empire, which was huge. And, and I think in their kitchens, did they not take the best out of each sort of region and, and try to recreate uh, uh, a dish. I mean, uh, let's say the baklava, I mean, there the, are the wars, a bit like now the hummus wars. Uh, the Greeks say it's theirs, the Turkish say it's theirs, but I, I think that there was a kind of melting pot there, and something uh, typical came out of it. So probably with all this globalization, something typical will come out in a different way. It was just a Maybe there's two cuisines involved. Maybe you have the sort of the westernized interpretation of traditional food, wherever it's from. And then if you want a nice bowl of hummus, well, you need to go to Beirut. <laughs> that's the only place today, in 20 years from now, you're going to get a good bowl of hummus that's authentic to the way it was, as it is now. Because western is constantly interpreting food to its own needs. Actually, Ottoman palace food was very domestic. They had the quite repetitive, very rich, a lot of butter, mm. a, lot, a lot of pastry. Pastries were the big thing. Sugar, and butter, and, and flour. Mm. Um, but there were uh, a lot of meat, uh, chicken and, and, uh, and, and yeah. lamb. Yeah. Hardly any fish, <coughs> although they were surrounded by, by fish. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, there are so many different cuisines in what constituted the Ottoman Empire, which are much more interesting than that, you know, around Anatolia and the Levant and the Black Sea and the Slavic parts and so on. And they are very different. They, they are very different uh, <coughs> still the present day, you know. The other time in the idea of Turkish food, there is no Turkish food. You know, there is, you know, Istanbul and the Aegean and there is southern Anatolia and there is the Black Sea, and now, and now, just like it's happening in Europe, you know, all from, since the 1980s, all these are opening restaurants in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. I had a big surprise in Istanbul, in a very grand restaurant there. There was, on the menu, borekitas. And it's borekitas, it's actually a boreka, a uh, little one, but it was filled with handrajo. With what? And it is actually a mixture of aubergine, onions, tomatoes, and that was a, a Jewish thing. And it was handrajo. That's it, that's Ladino. Yes. And there is a woman, and by chance I met the woman who was making it. She made it, and she sold it to a restaurant. So 
sometimes something happens like that, maybe the shakshuka happens like that. And in Israel, probably things like that happen. Somebody manages to sell something somewhere. And it becomes that. Okay. I didn't find you mentioned a quote to me just to, before we ask some questions. Do you have people yes. to say? It was, um, now, was it Edgar Morin and uh, uh, a French uh, politician who actually comes from Salonika and he wrote in his book Vidal et Lesia. Uh, in it, he wrote that um, gastronomy is the kernel of culture of the society. And, uh, and pastelicos is the kernel of the kernel of Salonika. And he said, uh, in the end, with some people, pastelicos is all that is left, left of their culture. What is that? It's actually a meat pie. It's not a boreca. It's, it's like a little pot. Pastelicos. But, um, Day and if it's different from the hala that you did have at home, and if you did call it hala, um, eh, because of course the idea of hala that, that we have today is the Ashkenazi hala that is a sweet bread with the eggs and, and sugar. So the Sephardi world is very different. So I was just wondering your experience of. Hala. <laughs> we never had hala. We just had or bread or a Shabbat bread. We just had bread. Uh, either flat bread or what we call salmon, which is a uh, small loaf. It's yeah, but kind of flat. Yeah, flat small loaf. But uh, I, I was introduced to hala here. I, I've never had it before. Uh, in the I think there is a you know a ritual element to this. Uh, I understand it. Why it's hala? You 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 can tear it with your hand. You don't have to use a knife. But for us, all our bread, you put you throw with your hand, you use a knife, you know. <laughs> uh, yes. No, no, there was no hala here. I think the only Sephardi or, or um, uh, Arab country that had uh, was really Algeria, the country that became French. So, the, so there was this French influence on the French Jews. So they would have hala. We did. Oh, because I remember my dad saying one day we didn't have a challah in India. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, all right, challahs are, we're going to have our roots again. We're going to eat the bread from now on. That's why they, I know this is Sylvia Nakamuli who is writing a book on Italian Jewish cooking. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. No, 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 it's okay. But no, because in Italy, in Italy also, we didn't grow up with a challah, it's just a bread. We did very much have a bread for Friday night. It was just well, not a loaf of bread. Friday night. A loaf of bread. It's yes. ordinary loaf of bread. Yes, it's yeah. an ordinary of, a loaf of bread without any shape, no braided, and uh, and a few people still do it, but not many. And um, <coughs> and I'm just fascinated because when you know, like a lot of people think the challah is wide, worldwide spread, and that there's just one type of challah, while there's so many different type of. Shabbat bread that we do not use any for the But I was wondering if today, when you do, on Friday night, has a braided Ashkenazi hala on your table. Yes. Well, we do. We, we do use hala sometimes, but I said to Frank, my husband, I said, I think we should just use uh, a different kind of bread sometimes. Uh, just well, as a real. Hala is a real. Well, no, it's not a 
placement and I don't know what. Uh, but I think any, any bread with this. So we do use challah. Do you use challah? I'm interested in uh, how the panel no, no, no. deals with uh, a typical Jewish mother or grandmother handing down recipes, particularly with seasoning and spices, where they say use a bit of this and a bit of that. And how do you actually get to the positives that you should be Well, doesn't every cook really cook that way? It's only when you want to uh, write a book or you want to give somebody who hasn't cooked before a recipe, then you have to sit down and see what you're doing. I mean, I think, I don't know about, about you. Well, my wife just walked into the room and often on a Friday she asked my mother, how do you make that? And I said, just a bit of salt. And she'll look at me like, just a bit of salt. My mom said, yeah, just a bit of salt. And then Alice will say, maybe a bit of turmeric. Yeah, yeah, there's a bit of turmeric in there. <laughs> Yeah, there's a little bit of comment as well. <laughs> Basically, she won't really divulge it all, but that's how it goes in my family. I'll make them go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, well, for me, I was, when I was researching, I was taking notes and writing down every word that people said. And I would ask them, how much flour? And they said, how much it takes. How do I know how much it takes? And they would say, you start working your dough, and at the same time you feel the lobe of your ear. And when it's, uh, when it's the same, this is the <laughs> And that's what, how, how to explain how you know. But actually, they're more or less right. They're more or less right, because actually, you can't really give a precise thing about how much water the flour takes. Because the flour, even from wheat growing in the same field, one year is different uh, absorption the next year. And if you're a food writer and you've written a book and you had bread uh, and, uh, and pizza, had pizza recipes, a few years later, I just thought, God, I've tried a pizza and it doesn't. It isn't the same quantity. And I phone up the flour board and they say, well, it, it isn't. It isn't at all. It's the same with rice. Yeah. Uh, when people say how much water to put with rice, to cook rice, it depends on the, on the type of rice, of course, but it also depends what you have. Yeah. And, and, you know, like basmati is not all the same. Yeah. And, and uh, so and it, even from the same place, exactly. the same field. Exactly. Because of the weather, because of how it grew, it will absorb a different amount of water. Yeah. I've seen about half the audience stroking their earlobes. I wonder whether you can tell us. Um, I wonder if you can tell us anything about the attitude of the um, Arab and other inhabitants of the countries from which you came to Jewish food. Do they do they value it? Do they like it? Or do they put it in the same bin as all Israeli things? Yeah, they put that. Well, I think when I went back, we never, I never realized that we had different food. <laughs> uh, we just ate what we had. But I knew that when I went back and, and met a lot of people, I was finding out what, about how Egypt had changed to write about it for the Observer, for instance, and later. And people said, you know, we miss so much the way we did. Even dishes, the foods that they made, we made them slightly differently. And <coughs> they would say, we miss that. And I know that uh, certainly a lot of Moroccans that I know keep saying, uh, we miss terribly the foods that our Jewish neighbors cooked. 
because there the Jewish food of Morocco was considered one of the great foods of Morocco. And it was different. And uh, of course, some people are still there, <coughs> but, uh, but uh, they do it, and they do keep mentioning it. Well, um, I think in Iraq, the, the answer is that, of course, the great majority of Iraqis don't know what to didn't know what Jewish food was, but except you know in particular neighborhoods, so and uh, uh, and there you know uh, the Jewish Saturday dish, the uh, to be uh, for those you know Christians and Muslims who tasted it, it was much appreciated and liked very much. But there was one uh, important fact there, which is that the uh, majority of the population who could afford it cooked in clarified butter, uh, which the Jews couldn't do because of the original law. So the Jews cooked in sesame oil. And in the old days, sesame oils had very strong taste, like the Chinese sesame oil that you get now here. And so Jewish neighborhoods tended to have a particular aroma of sesame oil. And those who didn't like Jews said, ah, that's terrible, Jews stink. Uh, and those who liked Jews said, oh, well, it's nice, you know, so it really depended on your attitude to Jews in any case. Thank you. Uh, I think we are predetermined genetically to love our grandparents' food. Uh, because I remember my, my uh, maternal grandparents came from Poland. And I remember uh, in Israel, my grandmother cooking very clear, slightly sour borscht, which I completely refused to eat uh, when I was uh, 12 or 11. And, and now I love it. And I consider it soul food for me. And, um, and you know, and uh, there was a Polish restaurant, Daikis, which changed hands, which used to make it so beautifully. Um, so yeah, I used to go there. I remember my grandmother and the, and the soup I wouldn't eat. I'm pleased to hear from another Ashkenazi because <laughs> yeah. I was very worried that in the middle of the book, you know, my late grandma said it means apple strudel, which I'm afraid is not a Sinai recipe. I was reprimanded by my wife for including me. Yes, hello there. Um, thinking about the title of this evening, Food Exile and Memory, one thinks of food as in a celebratory way. But can you also talk about other foods of sadness uh, as well? What do you think? Foods of sadness? Yes, reflecting the title, which exile. includes exile and memory. And well, I mean, you talk about funeral foods, yeah. foods of sadness, you know, but uh, they're not very specific. You know, they, uh, I think that in the general uh, Middle Eastern uh, custom, uh, among all the religions, um, is that you know, at the funeral you send around hello uh, to your neighbors, family, and acquaintances, and you ask them to say a prayer over the, the soul of the departed. And I suppose, you know, for people, uh, there's a particular halwa which was uh, made from semolina and, and sugar and uh, cardamom, and you would uh, put it in bread and send a uh, child or a servant around the neighborhood with a little piece of paper saying the name of the deceased. People were asked to say prayer over uh, the soul of the deceased. And that's true for Christians and Muslims and also on ritual occasions, you know, like Muharram for the Shia Muslims, you know, which is mourning over the martyrs to say and so on. And they would in the street distribute food and and ask people to say a prayer on the soul of the saint. So that's the only thing I can think of. That. I mean, <laughs> to answer your question, I think the word exile uh, does, it, does, does evoke sadness and separation. Uh, but I don't think food ever does that. I think food is always something wholesome. Uh, unless you're talking about symbolic foods that have to do with death, that's different. But, 
Is that what you wanted to know? Is it, yes, there is a food yes. that uh, makes Just, you sad? Well, I'm thinking about tales of the memories. I'm going to make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking, okay, but also Mike was saying about yeah. food is, is storytelling, which I think is, is, is a lovely thought, that it's linked to storytelling. And it's that notion that you know there's also this aspect of exile. Yeah. That yeah. Is, so, so I just wondered whether there might be, you know, whether that might also be reflected in some way in, in this type of conversation. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people that I know, I mean, because I do keep meeting people who are tasting recipes of their childhood, because that's part of my work, or, or who come and tell me, I ate it and I cried. And I think this thing of nostalgia, nostalgia because the past, and especially if the past is far in another country, or it's feelings of loss as well, as a joy of remembering. But I think loss is part of it. And people do say that food can make you cry. It touches you deeply. I think I have time for one last question. Okay. Uh, so, so far we have been uh, talking about uh, food um, when it regards to the past in a very uh, positive way, supplemental way. Um, and as, as an Israeli, who, uh, my origins are from Poland. I can't hear her. Can you hear? Okay. And um, so actually, the, the, the entire Polish um, tradition, traditional food, at least in Israel, uh, is very much denigrated. I mean, uh, my mother, who was, who was Israeli born, and so other relatives of mine, they would not think of making a filter fish. No way. And the only gesture to, to our kind of traditional food uh, we know where to buy those things, uh, you know, on the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and, uh, and Passover, in uh, sort of religious quarters in Israel, in the neighborhood. But no one of, of, let's say, of my family and other families would make these foods, you know. And uh, so, so I just wanted to present the possibility of something other than nostalgia and uh, you know right. like uh, you know it it's it been cry we feel like we just have to eat it so <laughs> and and, and uh, so this you know that's how we treat uh, this this kind of food and it's not exceptional you know because also in other respects the kind of the <coughs> polish mentality is very much uh, Denigrated, not, not the Russian, but let's say many, many, many uh, Israelis are Polish. I think in the early days in Israel, people who came from Russia and Poland wanted to forget their culture. And they were also encouraged to forget it because it, it reminded them of persecution and, and of uh, unhappiness. And uh, it was food that really made them feel bad. I think in that case, it would make them feel sad because they wanted to forget it. And they wanted to become a new person with a new kind of food. But that also happened, I think, to, uh, to Sephardim who went to Israel at one time in the beginning because I remember at one time, uh, people were ashamed to say what they ate at home at school when they were asked, what, do you, what does your mother cook? Everybody said, stay him and chips in. <laughs> <laughs> they were sure they were OK. But, uh, uh, and I think after that, I mean, I remember doing, to interview people at, the, at um, the army who were dealing with the cooking in the army. And they said that, uh, only the Sephardim wanted to be cooks in the army. 
at that time. Now it must have changed because it's fashionable to be a cook. But, uh, but uh, when they were told, uh, because uh, they were told you'll have these tomatoes, you'll have you know, the kind of foods that you've got to make, and they were told make it like your mother. No, they didn't really want to do what their mother made. And they never wanted to look at what their mother cooked because they were ashamed of it. So there are all kinds of reasons why people reject their food. There was a lot of pressure to fit in in the early yes. days. Yes. There was a lot of writing about. Yes. Um, I mean, to be a Sephardi was not the most popular thing you wanted to be in Israel. Do you think we, we gain popularity through food? Yeah. I think it helps. You know, if, uh, if the food is appreciated, you certainly, certainly now become popular in a different way. Well, thank you. I know that the light time we have to go out in 10 minutes, so we don't have time for more questions, I'm afraid. Um, but I suppose I say thank you to Ellen and Abby and Hannah, to everyone at the museum who's helped put together the booklet. Uh, thank you to you for your questions, but most importantly, thank you to everyone.